right. Can you hear me all good? How are you feeling? Whew. I'm going to give you half an hour where we're going to look into the future, but uh, with a little bit of a but, I'm not going to take you into all of the possible futures that we're seeing. Right now in the recorded music industry, we're seeing a lot of huge uncertainties, right? Um, I'm not going to dive into all of them. Uh, that would take uh, much more time. So I will be focusing on a few perspectives of how to look into the future, the possible futures, because we do not do predictions. We cannot predict anything, but we can look into the probable and possible futures. So I'll be diving into the role of music more than I will be diving into technology, just so you know it um, a little bit more. All right. <clears throat> So just a quick introduction. So I come from the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. Um, we're a nonprofit think tank that was, we also just recently had our 50th anniversary. We were one of the first futures institutes um, in the world. Um, and we were created by a former uh, general secretary of the OECD and our former finance minister in Denmark, uh, Torge Christensen, in order to look into the possible futures and look a little bit more than four years ahead. There's, what politicians do, right? So they look into the next election period. But being aware of working more structurally and understanding and getting away from this short-termism uh, and figuring out how do we approach all these huge uncertainties that we are standing here um, and inspire change and innovation. So I have the lucky position at the Institute to just focus on media. So the you know, development of media, where we're heading, um, which also involves the entertainment business and obviously also music. I am a, a member of the Danish media board, so I get to give uh, the public service money to the different media and looking at innovation there as well. Um, and I used to work in the Danish Broadcasting Corporation, also looking into new media and how that would affect the media industry. So this is something I, I really work a lot with. All right. So, here we go. I think this is very essential when talking about the possible futures, because we do not know. None of you here, even, you know, it's, sometimes it's even worse when you're an expert because you think you know it all. That's kind of the expert bias, right? You think you know everything in your industry, and that's when we tend to be a little bit closed for the possible futures. But we do not predict the futures. Uh, we try to make sure that we're prepared for the possible futures, and we understand that there is no linear future. So what to expect today? Let's go into the art of thinking of futures. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that before moving into the industry. I'm also going to address the future consumers because now we heard what are people buying. You know, we heard about the state of the now. We heard about the, press, the, the, the past, you know. So now we're going to dive a little bit into the future consumers. What are some of the things we're seeing here? What are some of the patterns? Yeah, so I'm really excited to, to look into that. And it's really, I, I totally agree with Leon, what he said in the beginning. And by the way, thank you so much for inviting me here on stage. And being in this amazing space, you can really feel the legacy, can really feel the history. Uh, and I understand that that can be both, you know, that can both be something that is preventing change, but also be inspiration for change in order to ensure that we keep the things, the quality that we have in this amazing space, right? Um, and then the new role of music. So first, the art of thinking in futures. So maybe as you also saw, we're called the Copenhagen Institute for Futures Studies. So it's an S in that. We do not believe there is a future. Um, there's only plausible futures. So, question to you, and sorry for the people who are not <laughs> here. Physically, when does the future start? Now? Gone? What? Oh, no. <laughs> we already crossed it. So we're like, next fut the future in the next sense. So uh, a lot of people said now. So what we really want to do at the Institute is to work on this mental flexibility, taking us away from the path-dependent thinking. Because if we see the futures now, and I do know that there are a lot of uncertainties right now, like, seriously, right now, that are really, really, uh, you know, looking like we're almost in the future. And, of course, the future is here uh, already. It's just unevenly distributed. So the whole idea is, when will this be distributed to a broader scale audience, and what will happen when we look at this? What we want to do is talk about the future in a little bit longer perspective. So five to ten years from now. Because if you're too close to where you are right now, it's difficult to get that mental flexibility going on into looking into the possible and plausible futures. 
So this is the futures cone, and some of you might have seen this before. This is a very standard tool that we use as futurists, but it's really, really good in, in illustrating that you know, we have a present, and obviously the present is not the same for everybody. That's in plurals as well. We have different standpoints, that's where we are. But it's all about the further you go into the futures, the more possibilities you have. You know, you have possible futures that might happen, plausible futures that could happen, probable futures that are more likely to happen. And then, of course, we have these wild cards coming in, disrupting everything, changing things that we have seen, for instance, when COVID came. Suddenly, we saw new patterns in behavior, new demands from users, new ways of consuming music. So how do we embrace all that uh, as a music industry, right? These are some of the things that we dive into and trying to work with them structured in creating scenarios and narratives. Because since there are no future, there are only plausible futures, we have to try and understand them, and that we can do by using narratives into what might happen in these possible worlds. So that's some of the mythology that we use at the Institute into diving into the possible futures. And of course, we all have preferable desired futures, but that doesn't mean that those are the ones that are going to happen unfortunately, but what we can do is of course try to see how can we, what strategic options should we do today in order to get to the place that we want. You can't control everything that's happening in the world, obviously, but you can work towards the preferable futures. So what we really try to do is to look at this in the sense that, you know, there are a lot of tactical things we have to work on within a very short sphere, like the next couple of years. We have some strategy going on. But the further you move out into the cone, you know, the more uncertainty you have. So what traditional strategists and people working with the now and the past and with a lot of data and with a more certainty, you know, they place themselves there and then taking that data and try to see if they can look into the future. This is a good thing. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. This is, you know, what we normally do. We take what we know and then we look into the possible futures. But we like to put ourselves here have that mental flexibility in thinking, what if, you know, these different things, diving into the huge uncertainties that we don't know will happen, and then seeing what would happen, how would our industry, how would our company, you know, depending on what your focus is, how would that look in those possible futures out there? And then reconnecting it back to our strategy. This is another tool we use, um, and I think it's very valid in the sense that we cannot just look into the possible futures and be all, you know, that, what do you say? Like you, it's very easy to look into these shiny things of new technology, but that's not our reality. Our reality is that we have a lot of weight of history. Then, of course, this push from the present, for instance, new technology or new behavior, you know, uh, new uh, consumer behavior needs and, and demands. Um, and then we have a pull from the possible futures that are pulling us towards something. So it's all about navigating in this space. And talking about legacy, for sure. <laughs> These kind of legacy industries, I, will, I work a lot with the media industry, also the public service media industry, a lot of legacy. Figuring out how does that fit to the possible futures. Those are some of the things we, talk, uh, we work a lot with. And it's all about reperception in my mind, awakening the possibility of the future being different from the past or how one expects it to be. This is a quote from one of the for per people who initiated the scenario processes. And I really think that that's a, a good way of looking at it, trying to ensure that you have the mental flexibility to do a little bit of reperception sometimes. Step out of your Excel strategic <laughs> tactical numbers and then moving into what might happen if some of these things. Hmm? But it requires courage to let go of certainties. You know, we want to know, right? We want to know the numbers. That would be, we want to know, we want to feel like we know what we're going to, but when you look into the futures, and especially in the long term, we do not. So what we're really trying to see, how can we embrace these uncertainties and see them as a future and not as a bug? How can we see them as something that might be a possibility to move into a different place than we are now and really work with the uncertainties? So that's what we do when we look into the possible scenarios and then trying to figure out whether we could do some you know, solutions uh, to, to pointing into these um, different uncertainties. But I think we can all agree, raise your hands if you don't, <laughs> that we are in the middle of tectonic changes in the music industry and the young audience are showing the way. Hands? Disagree? Nope. <laughs> and I think this is really important you know, to look at because what are the future consumers? 
Who are they and what do they want? So we work with something we call the liquid consumer. And the liquid consumer is kind of different from the usual way we look at consumers because we cannot, you know, sort of put them into demography or saying that they're this and this age or this and this gender and hence they, you know, they do this and this. Instead, it's like, I want a better me. I want something that can transform me and I want it seamlessly. I also want a better world. We're definitely seeing that with the more wokeness um, and also a focus on sustainability. We really need to take care of our planet. But we also, if you ask consumers, you know, sometimes they answer differently than what they actually do. But a lot of people, they really just want it fast and personalized and in the way that they need it right now. So this is some of the things we're seeing. You know, and they're impatient, they're disloyal. You know, there are new ways that the media industry needs to find to engage, uh, to create engagement and trust in this digital age. You know, I know a lot of people, I guess, would trust the brand here, but it's getting less and less that you trust the traditional institutions, that the, the future consumers trust uh, brands in that sense. So the liquid consumer also has a demand, an increased demand for tailor-made and seamless solutions that leads to hyper-personalized and curated experiences based on real-time user data and insights. So this is something we're really seeing growing, and we're getting more and more adjusted to it as consumers, right? And we, we expect this to happen, basically. And we also expect to be at the center of the interactions and creation processes. And that's what we've really seen when we're moving into the metaverse and social media and TikTok, that of course I cannot not mention. So we have this battle for mind space with fragmented attention, with platforms such as TikTok, Twitch, Discord, and Reddit. Everybody knows all these four platforms? God, <laughs> it's a lot of the audience that I talk to don't know half of them. And I think it's very important that we try to understand how these young, consumers are you know, starting to, to, to get their access both to content and also to music, right? It's playing a, a big role here as well. We have new formats, short video, authentic content, live streaming, you know, new pillars to cultivating deep engagement. And we're seeing this prosumer from extreme individualization also to co-creation processing involvement, like you could say being part of a TikTok music challenge with user-generated vi videos and uh, augmented reality filters. Those are some of the things to really push, you know, some new content and new songs out and get it to be viral. So, of course, how do discoverability? That's one of the biggest things in this time of age with endless media. I'm getting back to that. But what is, you know, how do people find music now? So 75% of TikTok users in the US say they use TikTok to discover new artists. And 63% say that they hear music that they never heard before for the first time on that platform. This is from a YouTube survey done in 21. I haven't seen the newest number, but I would only expect that to grow. <clears throat> yeah, TikTok. <laughs> so how many of you have based your, uh, your companies or your strategies on TikTok? Kind of a bit uh, uncertainty. That's some of the things that come. Suddenly, this huge uncertainty of regulation comes in. Will TikTok be regulated? And what platforms will we then move to? Uh, how, do, how, how do we sort of navigate in this in order to figure out how to, to proceed? And I do not believe that the formats that I discussed would go away. Now it's just moving to another platform. Uh, and I won't, uh, maybe. <laughs> Again, it's a big uncertainty. But a lot of things are happening around TikTok, and we can discuss that in a geopolitical way or whatever we want. But fact is, these big changes can come, and you need to be prepared for that. And you need to know that your business should not be you know, built upon one sort of way or one technology or one platform. That is not uh, future-proofing. Another thing we're seeing with this sort of relationship on TikTok and, and the way that we use our phones and our smartphones has become a part of us is that, you know, the, this online-offline thing, the glitch between the digital self and the physical embodied self is not a separation anymore. I mean, the first thing, how many of you, the first thing you do in the morning is to go and take your smartphone? <laughs> the young generation, for sure, you know. Uh, and this kind of, our relationship, we feel like we're naked if we forget our smartphones. Something of us is sort of missing. And for me, this is the first phase of moving into what we call the metaverse or what is being called the metaverse. Forget about the name, whether it's the metaverse or what it is. Um, but it's this convergence of our physical and virtual lives. Uh, and we have to figure out how to deal with that and how to understand the needs and demands and the way to consume music, obviously. <laughs> Where will they consume their music in these new realities? Gen Z might 
be. <laughs> the first uh, generation to feel more like themselves in the metaverse than in real life. This is an interesting uh, survey done by, for 3,000 gamers in the US, where for the first time, 52% of the Gen Z said that they feel more like themselves in the game than they feel like themselves in the physical life. So, this is an interesting trend. Can, we will see that more broadly, I don't know. You know, of course, it's in gaming, but we definitely see that this relationship between our physical selves and our virtual selves are starting to, you know, kind of grow in a different way, and we have to figure out how our consumption behaviors will follow in this. And I think a, a lot of the elderly, pub, <laughs> the elderly audience might have a difficulty in understanding this. But I think if we look to the young people playing Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, you know, you name it, they really feel like the digital assets they have, the skins there, you know, the persons that they represent are really part of them. So we have to understand how that works. So that was a bit about the consumers. Here, a little bit about the new role of music. Because I think <laughs> it's not too difficult to say that we have a lot of generational gaps. There's a massive generational gap how to approach recorded music and not at least how to discover music. So this kind of discoverability. There's an increasing amount of people who don't know the artists and names of their favorite song. They just know the melody or a 10 second snippet from TikTok. And actually, you know, I'm 45, right? So I'm, and I consider myself part young, part old. Anybody else in that? <laughs> <laughs> I feel young, bear with me. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, like, I don't know the, I don't know, in my Spotify playlist, sorry for <laughs> bringing on Spotify, but in my playlist, right, I don't know the names of the musicians. I was, I just, I was in the South by Southwest attending a BPI um, event, and suddenly I heard a, a song I had on my playlist, and there was the artist, and I had no idea who she was, but it's like, great! <laughs> but I, I see, I, and then that's an interesting trend. So this kind of, um, you know, the, how do generations consider music, artists? And I know there's a huge sort of also fan base and, and people who really, there's a lot of fans still, but there's also a lot of music that's just there and not necessarily part of that uh, game. So music beyond genres is another thing, you know, it's hard to, this is a, an, an article from the New Yorker um, by Amanda Petrusic, not sure how to pronounce that. Um, it's hard to imagine the Grammys without the categories, yet they feel increasingly irrelevant to the consumption of music. What is the role of a genre? You know, what, also because most people who listen to a genre, let's say hip hop, also listen to something else. In a in more, you know, so even though we might feel associated with a certain genre, those are also converging more and more and becoming maybe more, even more difficult to, <laughs> to base things on genres. Contextual music is another thing. This whole idea that music knows what I want and can help me in my life. We were seeing one of the startups from Red, Abby Red, that was uh, Medi, Medi Music, thank you. Uh, which is really interesting, right? So making you feel better if you deal with anxiety or if you're very stressed. I mean, I travel a lot. I would love to have some kind where I get stressed for traveling a lot. And it would be nice to have music that could accompany me and know what I need when. Uh, I have this one. Do you know what this is? Hmm? It's an aura ring. So that tracks my data all the time. And <clears throat> you might say, okay, we also have a little bit of surveillance uh, thing going on, how much data do you actually want to share? And those are one of the, you know, those are some of the big uncertainties. How much are we allowing this to enter our lives? Uh, we don't know yet. But, it's, but, but constantly we are getting more and more adjusted to having all of these, you know, um, gadgets, wearables, Headables, was that what it was called? <laughs> Hearables, uh, things that you have around you. We are we're welcoming in our lives. And I think that boundary might or might not, depending on the acceptance of these new technologies in our society, be more and more coming closer and closer to our lives. And that will also impact our consumption of music and how music is going to be sort of part of that. This is an interesting project. It's Shipstead. It's a Swedish uh, media company, one of the biggest media companies in Sweden. They have created a lab to look into the new consumer formats. So they actually try to look into those called news avoiders. They prefer to say news outsiders because it's not like people who don't read the news don't want to know the news. They just don't feel like there are any formats that are fit for their sort of mm, needs and behaviors and you know, what they want. So, this 
this lab is looking into new kind of possible ways to how can we make news good for the young people again. So it's a group of people that they hired, young people, from places where they didn't get, feel like they get any news that they could use, and looked into the possible new consumptions of news. And one of them was music as news. Somehow being able to put music into understanding things like recession and stuff like that. A feature that enables users to transform written text into music. You know, we have to open our minds, come on, flexible here, flexibility in our mental state. Users can search for genres, artists, tempo, and even a specific song that they want the news to be based on, and AI technology then enables a personally relevant experience of news as music. So this is all, of course, on a very sort of explorative phase, um, you know, like trying to uh, design some possible futures, but it's an interesting project, I think, and interesting to look into what is the role of music 10 years from now. Um, we're dealing with a lot of mental issues, you know, that could be interesting. So, this video here is demonstrating my view, I think, you know, what is the metaverse? <laughs> I've been talking about the metaverse for about two years now, uh, and a lot has happened, and right now we're down in the valley of uh, disillusionment after being up in the hype cycle, where other things are right now. So, for me, this is sort of the convergence, right, of our physical and digital lives that will bring people, spaces, and things together in virtual, augmented digital spaces. So it's not just about putting on a VR headset and then joining in on a, on, a, on, a con, uh, on a concert. It's much more about figuring out how this relationship between our physical reality and our virtual layers and virtual reality will be part of our lives in the future. So we don't have this technology yet. We do not know exactly what technology will push this. We don't have you know, the use cases that will show us that there are a lot of people who want this. <laughs> Do we really want this? How do we create meaningful metaverses? How do we create meaningful experiences in it? But if you look at this, it makes, for me at least, it makes sense. It enhances experiences. It helps you in your daily life. It gives you some extra sort of all that information that we're used to getting on the computer will be in that instead. So it's kind of like having all information in our environment in that sense. And that, you know, there are good and bad. There are always... Uh, you know, some, we have to be aware of both the possible implications on the good side and on the bad side, of course. Uh, I love this last feature. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we all want to do that. Um, probably also with music, getting it off sometimes, right? But it's interesting. I think in order to just think a little bit about the possible, you know, not being put into just one of the things of what the metaverse can be, because in many ways I think the metaverse is, is misunderstood. Um, some people think a lot about the metaverse as virtual worlds. That's where, you know, the central land, Fortnite, Minecraft, all that. Or some people put it into virtual reality glasses. Uh, you know, that it's something that Meta wants you to go to Horizon and experience concerts there. Um, then we have the augmented reality, but we also have to use, uh, to think about all the other things that are happening within this ecosystem. Uh, digital twins is huge in the industrial. You know, but there needs to be sound there as well. There needs to be music as well in these kind of environments. Uh, there's a lot of things being worked on in replicating our physical future into the digital lives. Huge things, NVIDIA, Unity, all these kind of huge companies that are suddenly entered the space and be extremely large players in the tech scene. Internet of Things, of course, we discussed it already with variables, coordinating everything smart, Web3, tokenization, not be addressing NFTs today, and I will not be addressing um, AI and machine learning and generative AI, but these are, of course, huge sort of <laughs> trends and, and things that are all, in my mind, connected together in this convergence of our physical and virtual lives, that we have to figure out how to deal with this. In many ways, also, this is a democratization of skills. I don't know if you saw any of these videos where you can actually learn playing things by adding these visual layers, you know, so that you just sit with whatever device might be, <laughs> uh, and then you can suddenly start to get all that information, and also being personalized in the sense that it knows your abilities, and it will help you from where you are, and improving, let's say, playing the drums. Um, and I think this, this is interesting, in order to, 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 to know and get the skills to create music on analog instruments, you know, it doesn't have to be all digital. And I think that's the thing. How do we ensure the balance 
of analog and digital and figure out the good and the bad and navigate in that. And of course, we're having this regulatory avalanche. I don't know how many of these uh, uh, will affect you uh, from the EU, but it will definitely affect how the ecosystem is behaving right now. So we have these things, and now I'm just going to say a lot of names like DSA, DMA, AI Act, that are going to be interesting to watch how they will affect this, because some of the products that you might be doing or services you might be considering might not fit into the possible futures. So, you know, you, you're talking about in the game industry, uh, dark patterns, for instance. That's going to be high-risk AI, which is being, going to be illegal if you look into the way that the AI Act is, uh, is being prepared right now. So you have to, to know what you can do and what you can't and how to navigate in this. So, how, how far am I? Can I? Uh, so, oh. <laughs> Yay! And you can also ask questions if you want to, but we're going to go straight to the panel afterwards as well. Um, but well, the way we like to see this and some of these many new possible roles of music that I have been diving into is to look at the uncertainties. So this is normally the framework we work with when we, when we create these uncertainties and dive into these narratives of the possible futures. So here, for instance, I think for the music industry, one of the biggest uncertainties we're looking at at the moment <coughs> is the adaption of technology. And of course, this follows the regulatory uh, sort of um, framework as well, where we have loose or strict regulation. And the adaption is with the users, right? How much will they accept the new technologies? How much will they put it into their lives? Uh, so how will that balance be? And in these four different scenarios, A, B, C, and D, you will have different or can see conditions for whatever you're doing within the music industry and how to work with that. So um, that's our way of looking into these high uncertainties that have a high impact and opening our minds towards understanding that there are a lot of different futures that we're looking into. And then also, of course, working with the futures. Sometimes it could just be nice to go back to the future. So uh, I found this Ted Goya, he's an American music, music historian. He did 20 predictions for the music business in 10 years back in September. This was one of them. And I think this is a nice one to also be aware of that we have so many good things, right? Maybe we should go back to some of that. So 10 years from now, a legitimate musical counterculture will arise with a cadre of new artists achieving superstar status while rejecting roles of influencer and content provider. The motto, music comes first, will be a key, a key part of their marketing message. And the music will have a name, but the word doesn't exist yet. So you know, this is also a very plausible future where people are denouncing all this sort of constant uh, content generation that we're seeing right now, where we're seeing a lot of stress among musicians, a lot of stress among people working in the industry, because you have to be always on. Is this something we want as society? Is this something we want as you know, industry? Will this be something that will happen? Yeah? Yeah, there's a lot of people getting more into the industry as well, which is quite good. There's a lot of people who love it. In fact, they just couldn't afford the music they were making. So definitely the music comes first. It's, it's been very common, the question of money and moving to a world where we don't have to be all in. Exactly. How do you ensure? Because without the mental health and well-being of the artist, you know, there, is, there will be no artist. We were, this is definitely something needed to be protected and figure it out. Again, the balance between the analog and the digital. Because in the digital world, and especially when you look at the metaverse and you look at the globalization, that is one of the megatrends. Of course, we're working with a lot of megatrends as well. We are, can be always on. I met a girl who's dancing in the metaverse and she has clubs all the time, like all the time during the day. You know, and it's like, that, that can't be very healthy to be dancing all the time, maybe, actually, could be healthy. <laughs> it's, 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 this particular thing might be a healthy one, but I mean, this always on thing, you know, how do we actually, and especially as an industry, right, and the products and the services that you provide, how do you work with that balance? Whew, so to finish all, I wanna really address this thing of non-linearity. Uh, so this is a bridge being built in Honduras, um, at the Oc, let's see, Chaluteca River. Uh, because the problem in Honduras, one of the problems, is that they have a lot of hurricanes. So all the bridges, they keep on you know, getting broken. So they hired, they contracted a Japanese company and said, we want the most you know, robust bridge that you could ever build. So they built this bridge. So what happened? The bridge stayed when the hurricane came, but the river moved. 
So <laughs> this is what you do not want to do. <laughs> Building something so robust, but where all the users, where all the, you know, the, the audiences are moving in a different way. You know, you can be so <laughs> resilient, but you know, that is not actual robustness. You have to move together with the rest of the environment. So in times of change, the learners will inherit the world, while the knowers will be beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. I love this quote, so I'll finish off with that and hope that it has inspired you a little bit to think into the possible futures of the recorded music industry. And of course, there are many more futures we could uh, explore, but we will be talking a little bit more about that in the panel from now. So thank you very much.